Star Wars 7x7 episode 2736. It's here, it's happened, the Book of Boba Fett, season one, episode one, which is also chapter one, called Stranger in a Strange Land has debuted, and today we're going to talk about our top seven takeaways from the episode. Punch it! Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Boyvod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. All right, an action-packed episode. Let's dive right into it with our top seven takeaways from Chapter 1 of the Book of Boba Fett, Stranger in a Strange Land. For a first takeaway, they've established that they're going to be doing a split-story narrative situation. What that means is that basically the episodes are almost divided in half, where Part of the episode is dedicated to the previous period of storytelling time, and the other half is dedicated to the current period storytelling time. And as for what's going to be covered in the quote-unquote previous period, if you will, it starts right from the jump in the Sarlacc, and we get to see Boba Fett's escape, which is something that, you know, we said was probably going to happen, and, you know, we weren't the only ones, of course, but... Yes, not only that, but we also see how he came to encounter the Tusken Raiders, and that story is turning out a little more complicated. I thought that it was going to be a, you know, Mandalorian Tusken love fest, and not quite, but that's okay. It was also good fun to see Jawas beating <laughs> up on Boba Fett. I don't know, that just amused me. It amused me when the Jawas beat up on the Mandalorian in Chapter 2 of that series, but yes, <laughs> that was good fun. And so we're starting to see Boba Fett's journey from his escape from the Sarlacc and presumably it'll go to you know where we see him now and it'll probably explain about his time in the desert and where he's been and what he's been doing Tamora Morrison in an interview back in June and it might you know said something to that effect that we were going to see more about his backstory and so yes <laughs> it's already on display and we'll talk about of course the present day period as part of the rest of our takeaways here Speaking of which, let's jump into our second takeaway, which is more of an administrative one as well. That Hollywood Reporter story where they talked about how the scenes that we've been shown in teasers and trailers and commercials and whatnot are only taken from half of the first episode because they just have so many surprises for us. Well, it's true <laughs> from a certain point of view in that the stuff that we saw is mostly from the present day story. Yes, there are some you know, past story time things, but you know nothing from this particular episode's past time story. And they have shown us stuff that go beyond the first episode, like that speeder chase through Moss Espa, for example, and the meeting with the mayor doesn't happen in this episode. So yes, there has been a lot of stuff that focused on the present day storyline of the first episode, but we have gotten some glimpses further ahead into the series as it turns out. All right, let's jump to a third takeaway, and this has to do with that Bakta pod that is in Jabba's palace. So yes, that's kind of where we thought it was going to be, and it turns out to be you know, a pretty nice Bakta pod, apparently. So maybe the Rebel Alliance just had an older model <laughs> or something like that, because this one works really well for Boba Fett. But it's also rather interesting and important that he kind of needs to be in there. After the big fight in the middle of town, he tells his Gamorrean guards that he has to get back to the Bactopod while he's laying on the ground and has been you know through this attack and so the Gamorrean guards are able to get him back to the palace and throw him unceremoniously into the pod and get him set up in there so the fact that he needs that I mean, you know, just that was a rather kind of desperate, like, I need to get to the Bactopod kind of situation. He's only 42 years old at this point, but in theory, he's been through a lot, and yet he's also not in the state that he was in the you know, past time, story time, the post-Sarlacc situation. He's had time to take care of himself at this point. Granted, his 42 years have probably been a lot rougher on him by comparison than your average 42-year-old, but still, it's kind of interesting that he needs it as badly as it does. It suggests that maybe he's a little more fragile than we might have given him credit for, and that's going to be something worth keeping an eye on as we get deeper into the series. And we're going to circle back around to that fight a little bit later, but for a fourth takeaway, I want to focus on the tributes that are being paid. So you'll recall in the trailers and teasers and commercials and whatnot that we've seen, there is some sort of dinner party that happens, and apparently that's happening, you know, episodes down the line, but 
Trandoshans and Aqualish are part of that dining scene, and in this episode, we see them arriving and paying tributes to Boba Fett. So basically, there has been some acceptance at this point of Boba Fett stepping in to this role as the leader of whatever they want to define the Tatooine space as in terms of gangster territory or anything like that. We don't necessarily know what his relationship is like with the Hut clans yet, or you know, how the rest of the Hut clans are dealing with anything, that's still obviously to be decided. But if these are, in fact, Jabba's lieutenants who are coming and paying tribute, then it suggests, number one, that whatever happens at that dinner party is something that's going to be taking it to a new level, or maybe there's a challenge to his leadership where he needs to meet with these folks and have deeper conversations about the future of his leadership of this organization. And it appears to be very limited in scope as well, so it seems to be centered around the city of Mos Espa, which we last saw in the prequel trilogy in Attack of the Clones and the Phantom Menace. And so that's actually a bit of a surprise because when we've seen Moss Espa on screen, like we didn't get a sense of it being as enormous as it's depicted in the Book of Boba Fett chapter one. So Moss Espa ends up being a bit of a surprise because not only is it apparently larger than we saw it in previous movies, but it's also kind of smaller scale in the sense of these are the people on whom Boba Fett is focused with tribute payments, right? I think Jabba's influence extended much further afield by comparison, so maybe he's just starting with the local stuff and he's going to expand outward from there. Okay, so let's circle back around to the fight scene, and this ties in the tribute situation with our fifth takeaway, which has to do with the Nightwind Assassins. So yes, that's the name of the group that we see fighting Boba Fett and Fennec Shand in this episode in the present timeline. And this is a group that's brand new. This has never been introduced before. And this is presumably the threat that happens when the quote-unquote mayor, the mayor of Mos Espa presumably, but mayor, uh, I don't know if that's just an actual civic title or if it has to do with somebody who feels like he, she, they have influence on Mos Espa and they need to be the ones in charge of the situation. But the mayor's major dormo shows up in that whole tribute situation and says, oh yeah, I'm not here to give you money and I think you should be giving me money. And... <laughs> Of course, they're like, well, you can leave without dying. And the Major Domo says, yeah, I think there'll be another delegation visiting you soon enough. Well, presumably that's the Nightwind Assassins when they show up. And yeah, thanks to the Gamorrean guards who step in and help fight them. I mean, otherwise, I think Boba and Fennec would have been toast. So in that particular case, it seems like Boba Fett's idea of ruling with respect instead of fear and creating loyalty through respect, that seems to be working out for him because if it weren't for that, then those Gamorrean guards would be nowhere near this situation and Boba and Fennec would... <laughs> <laughs> not be on the census anymore. For a sixth takeaway, we know a little bit more about Jennifer Beals' Twilight character. She is Madame Garza Whip, and yes, she is a Twilight of a certain level of importance and influence with her sanctuary, which is basically a cantina and a casino, and who the heck knows what else they have going on there. And this seems like it's going to be a more important connection for Boba Fett as we move through the series. I mean, the fact that he went to her personally, right, to make that visit and check in and whatnot. And based on the type of situation Madame Garso Whip has going, this seems like a place where Boba Fett is going to be gathering information and Madame Garso Whip is going to be a prime source of connection to the underworld and to rumors and gossip and that sort of thing. That's what I feel like is being set up for us with this. And for a seventh and final takeaway, we'll talk about some sort of just initial like cameo-ish like surprises. Like for example, is that Max Rebo? I'm seeing things that are saying, yes, it is definitely Max Rebo. I mean, in how many <laughs> characters who look like that and are playing keyboards show up anywhere in Star Wars? Well, yeah, it seems like it might well be Max Rebo inside the sanctuary. So good for Max, got it. <laughs> another job after the whole Jabba thing didn't work out. Also 8D8, the torture droid from Jabba's dungeon is now serving as the, uh, I, I guess, the MC for welcoming tributes in. So at least he's still 
on the uh, on the payroll and getting work, so that's fun. And then that sand monster that we see in the fight with uh, Boba and the Rodian and the young Tuscan child, well, that creature is brand new. That's not one that's ever been explored in Star Wars before, so we've got a bit to learn about that. But holy cow, when that thing popped up, I was like, what the heck is that? That thing was crazy. And so, yeah, hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about that <laughs> in the days to come. So there you go. Those are our seven top takeaways from the Book of Boba Fett Chapter 1, Stranger in a Strange Land. And that is going to do it for this episode of the show. And it just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it, as always. And may the Force be with you, wherever in the world you may be. Star Wars 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited, other respective trademark and copyright holders. May the Force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.